Welcome to Brain in a Vat. We are delighted to be joined by Theron Pummer, and we're going to be talking about effective altruism. Uh, Theron, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yes. The thought experiment is really just a simplified version of an everyday case that we'll encounter. So suppose you have $6,000 and you're planning on giving it to charity. And one charity, for every $3,000 they receive, they save a life. Another charity, for every $6,000 they receive, they save a life. So basically your choice is between an expectation with the $6,000 saving one life or saving two lives. Now I claim that in a range of cases with this structure, it's wrong to give to the less cost-effective charity rather than the more cost-effective charity. So in some cases, maybe you're rich and so it's not very costly to you to give up $6,000. Maybe you haven't given very much over the course of your life. Maybe in some set of cases like that, you'd actually be required to donate the $6,000 to save lives. And in that case, I would say you're morally required to give to the more cost-effective charity rather than either of the other, do either of the other options. But the interesting twist is that in a range of cases, it can be permissible for you not to give the money to charity at all, but still morally wrong to give to the less cost-effective charity rather than the more cost-effective charity. So maybe you're not super rich. So giving $6,000 would be significant cost to you. And maybe you've already given quite a bit of money over the course of your life. So now you're permitted to take some breaks. Maybe in this particular case, you're not required to give $6,000 or even $3,000 to charity, but you're going to, you're planning on doing that. I still claim that it would be wrong to give that to the less cost-effective charity rather than the more cost-effective charity, at least in a range of cases. So that's my sort of opening gambit. And I'm curious what you think about those claims. So. I, I said this to you earlier, it blows my mind. The reason it blows my mind is because as soon as you say to me that if in a given case, it is permissible not to give anything, but once I do give, I better give to the more cost-effective charity, that it is wrong to give to the less cost-effective charity. Then it seems to me like what you're saying is it is super erogatory for me to give. In other words, it's not required for me to give it super erogatory, but it, it, how can it be possible for one super erogatory action to be wrong and one super erogatory action to be required if I'm performing a super erogatory action at all? It seems like the very definition of super erogatory is that a super erogatory action can't be wrong. So I'll respond with another case, and then I'll try to offer like an explanation of in, in that case, how it is that one of the acts that you're not required to do could nonetheless be wrong. So suppose that you're in a nearby rescue situation and there's a boulder headed toward a group of people. And right now it looks like you can save either one of those individuals, or you could save two others. So you could either save A or you could save B and C. Unfortunately, to save either, you'd have to sacrifice your legs. And I claim that that's a sufficiently great cost to yourself to make it permissible for you not to rescue either A or rescue B and C. So it's fine for you to do nothing in that case. But if you save A rather than B and C, I claim that's wrong. And so I find that claim intuitive and I think that we can draw an analogy between that kind of case and the charitable giving case, but so far I haven't really offered any explanation. And so the explanation is, it goes like this, basically you're required to do what you have most moral reason to do, unless you have a prerogative or what I call permitting reason not to do it. And in the Boulder case. I take it what you have most moral reason to do is save B and C. And then you have next most moral reason to just save A, and then you have least moral reason to do nothing. And obviously saving B and C is permissible. That's what you have most reason to do. Doing nothing is permissible, even though it's not what you have most reason to do, because that act is protected by a prerogative or permitting reason. That's the only way that you get to keep your legs. But if you sacrifice your legs to save just A, 
that act is not what you have most moral reason to do. So in order for it to be permissible, you better have a prerogative to do it, but you don't because the cost to you of sacrificing your legs to save A is exactly the same as the cost to you of sacrificing your legs to save B and C. So what's going on in my case is both these acts are not required. They're beyond the call of duty in that sense. They're both acts that you have a sufficiently strong prerogative not to perform, but one of them falls below what you have most reason to do. And it's not protected by a prerogative. So that one's impermissible. A couple of thoughts. The first one would be to give you another case. So imagine that my father is a terrible LS sufferer. And I decide that I'm going to donate an enormous amount of my money to curing ALS. But it turns out that money could rather have been spent on malaria nets and would have saved a hell of a lot more people. Now, it seems odd to claim that I've done something immoral by donating my money to the ALS suffering. And also it might be that no one ever gets saved from ALS. It might be that the millions of dollars that I donate never develops a cure. But it would be odd to say that I've done something wrong. It seems that if my obligation whenever donating is to maximize, well, then most donation is immoral, that there would be some strict hierarchy of charities that one ought to donate to only in the event that you're donating. And that if you fail to do that, you've done something immoral. And I wonder about when we say you've done something immoral, who have you wronged? So in your Boulder case, it's not clear to me who you've wronged. We think that it's perfectly permissible to do nothing. So I'm not going to lose my legs for either of these, these three people. And we said, that's fine. Of course, no obligation whatsoever to lose your legs. And then let's say I said, I kind of arbitrarily say, oh, I just like the look of A's mustache. And that's why I'm going to lose my legs to save him. You say, no, you've done something incredibly wrong. You should have maximized. You should have saved B and C. And the mustache is a kind of arbitrary thing to push you over the edge. Now, who have I wronged? Did I wrong B and C? I didn't owe them anything. I didn't wrong them when I did nothing. So when you say my failure to maximize is wrong, what have I wronged? What principle? Good. Yeah. I mean, on the ALS example, I mean, I take it that we have personal projects that can both permit us not to give to charity and to give to less effective charities rather than more cost-effective charities. So if a project could permit you, if it could be su sufficiently significant to permit you not to even give to charity, then there would be ranges of cases where it would also be sufficiently powerful to permit you to give less cost-effectively rather than more cost-effectively. So in cases where that's not the case, right? Where like you have two ALS charities and they're kind of equally in line with your projects and one would save twice as many lives. Then my claims about my original case would get off the ground and stay with the Boulder case, because then there's no difference in cost to you. Now, I mean, I don't think that like any old project will do though, right? It needs to be more than just a little fleeting desire or whim. I think it needs to be something that's important to your life. It needs to be a significant cost to justify falling that far short. But I think it's possible for there to be projects that are that significant. On the who is wronged question, I mean, that's a really great and deep question, I think, about the classic toric numbers problem, where you could either, even before bringing costs into the picture, right, you could just imagine, like, I could costlessly save A, or I could costlessly save B and C. If I save A, who have I wronged? It doesn't look like I've wronged B and C because they're just individuals. I can, and I can't wrong the whole group of B and C. That doesn't really make sense. At least this is what some people say who are skeptical of the claim that I'm required to save B and C rather than save A. And there are different ways that one could respond. I mean, one is to just say, well, some actions can be wrong, even if they don't wrong anyone in particular. And I'm actually quite attracted to that view. If not in cases like this, then I could tell you some other cases where I definitely think it's plausible that you can act wrongly without wronging anyone in particular. But yes, it's more controversial in a case like this, where you've got particular person A and particular people B and C over there to claim that acting wrongly by saving just A uh, would not wrong anyone. But look, you could say, B and C were wronged. You failed to take into adequate account the moral reasons in this case. So there was, there's a moral reason to save A's life. 
and there's a moral reason to save B's life and a moral reason to save C's life. And there are objections, of course, to what I'm about to say, but it seems plausible that you could aggregate the reasons in some way, in some shape or form, so that it's not that we have to say that two reasons are twice as powerful as one, but it seems plausible that there's more reason to save the two rather than just save the one. And so if you fail to respond to the balance of moral reasons appropriately by just saving A, then plausibly B and C could say that they were wronged in that way, that you didn't take account of the reasons and weigh them up properly. Well, I wonder whether you don't have a demanding this problem. So traditionally effective altruists have been utilitarians. And my understanding is that you're not, you are trying to provide a type of effective altruism that doesn't require utilitarianism, but is consistent with it at least. And it's also consistent with a deontological position. So, so the kind of case that I have in mind is this, this case, by the way, comes to you from my partner. When I raised his position with you, he said, but hold on, what about this? Okay. So he says, so I live in an apartment and I've got a spare bedroom. It seems like it would be not an enormous imposition to let one person come and stay in that spare bedroom. But if I'm inviting one person to come and stay in that spare bedroom, a homeless person off the street, I could invite two persons to come and stay in that spare bedroom and maybe three, one on the couch. And at some point you're going to say, but hold on, your personal projects are being threatened. So perhaps it's going to get in the way of very important projects that you have in your life. But now I ask myself, so why do those personal projects matter? Because that guy at the moment in Johannesburg, it's very cold and there's people on the street who are not being looked after by the state. It seems like no matter how important my personal projects are, maybe one of them is this brain in a VAT recording, there could be someone on their couch right now. And that seems more important than my brain in a VAT recording. Why do these personal projects matter in light of these much more serious concerns that people around me might be having. And if we're not going to stop at one, two, three, maybe four or five, where do we stop? And aren't we landing up in the same demanding this problem that utilitarians face? Well, like I responded to your other question, I'll try to just give another case and hopefully see if you share my intuitions about that case and then try to draw analogies back to your example. So imagine that you've entered a land where every minute you could stand on a green button and that would save a different, perhaps unseen anonymous stranger from getting killed by a boulder. So they're on the other side of a wall. Maybe they're nearby though. And you get the information from some reliable source, like on your iPhone. And it looks like, yeah, each minute. The project based prerogative or cost based prerogative have to have that minute to yourself is very weak. I mean, it's just one minute. And the reason that you have is incredibly strong. It's to save a person's life. Even if it's an unidentified person, it'd still be saving somebody's life. So it looks like if you're just weighing prerogatives and reasons at each time in isolation you would be required to stand on that green button for your entire life. And now I take it that the cost would be too high. So I'm taking it as kind of an intuitive starting point here that you could of course disagree with, but I'm taking it as an intuitive starting point that you're not required to stand on the green button for your whole life. Now, at what point can you get off the green button? I'm not sure. I mean, there are going to be epistemic issues about that, but also issues about vagueness and cutoff points. Like if you say, well, you can get off after saving a thousand people, then that invites the objection. Well, why not a thousand and one? And if you try to dodge that sharpness cutoff issue by saying, well, it's vague how many people I have to save then that has its own set of puzzles surrounding it. So in the book, I just say just spot me some kind of cutoff point. So I know that there are issues about sharpness and vagueness here, but let's just imagine that there is some cutoff point, whether sharp or vague, that's in principle acceptable. So we could set aside that issue temporarily. The kind of mechanism I have in mind is that as you save more and more people and incur more and more costs, your prerogative not to incur further costs in saving people gets amplified. I think it's not just the past costs that you've incurred that are relevant, 
I think it's also future costs that you reasonably expect you will incur. Those are also relevant. So if we're thinking about what should I do now, your evidence about how much you will sacrifice in the future could actually make it permissible for you not to help now by amplifying your prerogative sufficiently. And actually it could turn out that at each time throughout your life, while you're in this case, I'm talking about where you confront another minute of standing on the green button at each of those times, it could be that you reasonably expect that you will stand on the green button enough as it were. And at each time thereby make it permissible not to help at each and every time. But that doesn't mean that it's permissible never to help at all, because I'm assuming that if you never helped at all, then you wouldn't be able to reasonably expect that you're going to help enough. So the thought is there is still a sense in which you're required to help enough in order to get your prerogative sufficiently amplified. So if you weren't helping enough, then there would be some particular cases where you wouldn't be able to reasonably expect that you're doing enough. And then your prerogative not to help wouldn't be sufficiently amplified and it would be wrong not to help. So how do you deal with an objection from someone who says, I'm a self owner. I own my body. When you require me to do something for someone else that amounts to slavery, when you say that I'm obliged to do it, as opposed to me acting out of discretion, you're forcibly using me against my own will and that's wrong. And so when you say I have to stand on that button for some minute, person can say, I don't have to stand on it once, never. It's my life. I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And if I decide to stand on this button, I'm doing something beyond the call of duty. And you should pat me on the back if I do it. But if I say, I'm going to spend the rest of my life sitting in the swimming pool, sipping martinis, that's my life. I get to do it. You get no control over my life whatsoever. That is a very undemanding view. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I find it plausible that you do have some prerogatives that are based in property rights. So if you have a property right to something, then that can give you some autonomy based prerogative to do with it what you please. But I mean, these things have their limits. So, I mean, if you were in a case like the green button case where there was nothing going on for years and years, and there's just this one opportunity to stand on the green button for a minute. And then you know that there's going to be nothing going on after that as well. So like your only opportunity to help ever is now it's Tuesday at noon or whatever. It would seem pretty bizarre to me if you could say, ah, oh, this is my body, my rights. I think that's too powerful a prerogative, especially if it were entirely costless to you, didn't even go against your projects. So it's not that there are no autonomy based prerogatives. It's just that they're not ultra strong. All right, so if I understand your view, it's that. It will always be cost costing something. In other words, if I say, I don't want to do this, you say you have to do it. That seems to be a cost. You're interfering with someone's free choices about how their life goes. Even if it would be better, it'd be optimal. I wonder about this as well. If you think that there's this obligation to optimize and you think the obligation to optimize happens for the benefit of others, would that be there for your own sake? So in other words, if you decide to become an athlete or an artist or a musician, are you obliged to become the best possible version of that thing? That if you become a suboptimal version that you've done something wrong? I think probably not morally, but there might be like prudential requirements to maximize. So it might be prudentially irrational if you shorten your life gratuitously, but I wouldn't myself claim that's immoral. I realize there's a debate about this and some people think that there are moral reasons to look after your own well-being. for what it's worth. I can incorporate that into my picture. So in the Boulder case, I could say, yes, there's not just a prerogative for you not to put your legs in front of the boulder, but actually there is a moral reason for you to refrain from putting your legs in front of the boulder. But what I would say about that is that there's still more moral reason to save these people's lives than there is to refrain from sacrificing your legs. So in order for it to be permissible for you not to sacrifice your legs, you'd need a prerogative. But, but getting back to more of the heart of your question, I suppose, yeah, I am open-minded to the thought that there would be requirements of effectiveness within these non-moral domains. I mean, there's instrumental rationality considerations too. So if you take running to be a project, 
then you might think it's a requirement of uh, instrumental rationality. You do that better. You do the thing that you've adopted as your project better if you ran faster or if you ran more elegantly or whatever. So there might be like these kinds of instrumentally derived uh, requirements of effectiveness as well as non-instrumental requirements of effectiveness within non-moral domains. But I don't think it would be morally wrong not to optimize in these various domains. I'm curious whether you think that this should become legal statute. In other words, should these become laws, not just morally obligatory, but legally obligatory to contribute in these ways. If you are contributing to contribute effectively, cost effectively, and does it carry over to the law or should it? There are a lot of really tricky empirical questions here about the effects of having a law that penalizes people for helping ineffectively. I mean, I suppose I'm already a little bit worried just about it becoming like a, a social norm or something to criticize people who give ineffectively. And part of my book actually talks about blaming people who are ineffective altruists and why I think actually it can be impermissible to help ineffectively, but nonetheless praiseworthy. Although I think that actually has a kind of non-derivative matter, but there are also these instrumental considerations for not blaming people who are trying to help, but helping ineffectively, right? It could be counterproductive. It could make it be like, well, if I'm going to get blamed just for helping then, but I'm not going to get blamed. If I just don't even help at all, then I'm not going to bother. And I, and I worry a little bit that making it, I mean, I know you didn't say make it illegal to give ineffectively, but as a kind of caricature of what you were saying, if it were illegal and there was some penalty to giving ineffectively, then I think it could have this effect. And I would worry about that, but maybe there's like a nicer version of this that uses carrots rather than sticks. And maybe you could give better tax incentives or tax breaks to people that give to charities that have a certain like effectiveness stars next to them. And then there would be, of course, debate about how to rank them. But I think in principle, something like that doesn't strike me as too implausible. What about shutting down the ineffective charities? So they're basically sponges for a finite amount of money in the world and they're wasting this money on their non-cost effective structure. I don't know, whatever it is that makes them only save three lives per thousand dollars instead of six. Why not just shut them down and say, you guys aren't allowed to operate. Now we can have dominance from the effective guys. They can suck up all the capital and we can save more lives. Why shouldn't we do something like that? Well, I think even if it's, it'd be most effective, like from an individual point of view, for me to give to the ones that are ranked at the top, it would be ineffective as a policy to shut down all the suboptimal ones, right? Because there are going to be people that won't spot the most effective ones or that will like want to give to the less effective ones. So you'll basically be throwing away a lot of cash and a lot of good, I think, if you do something like that. And then I guess there's just the thought as well, that if you have the other suboptimal charities still in existence, it's like they're waiting in a queue, right? So if there were effective altruists working effectively as a group, they would channel loads of donations to the most cost-effective ones to the point where, you know, giving more and more to those won't do as much good. And then those will get lowered down on the list. And so you're going to walk like next bests on the range of options for once for when you've like adequately saturated the currently most cost-effective charities at the top. That, that would be one reason or two reasons, I guess, for not <laughs> for just obliterating all the suboptimal ones. There are other reasons as well, by the way, but the, yeah, those are two that, that I think of. Do these obligations that I have to the homeless people living a few streets away also carry over to homeless people living not just a few streets away, but maybe cities away, countries away, continents away. Do my obligations get diluted as there's distance between me and the person who needs help or are my obligations just carried over as is? I think there are a few differences between the case of helping someone just one street over and the case of helping somebody on a different continent. But physical distance is of course, one of those differences. And I myself don't think that's a morally relevant factor. Francis Cam has a great paper from 2000 in law and philosophy, 
where she argues that distance does matter, but I'm not convinced by this. And then I argue against it in the book, in chapter five of the book. Basically, I give cases that adjust for all possible confounding factors other than distance and just very distance and ask when we just vary distance on its own, could that make a morally relevant difference? And so we could start out with like the button case again, where there's an unseen anonymous stranger on the other side of a brick wall. And if you pay $3,000 to press the green button, you'll save their life. But then just imagine another version of the case where instead of like being 10 feet away on the other side of the brick wall, they're a thousand miles away on the other side of the brick wall, but everything else is exactly the same as before. It seems to me absolutely shocking. <laughs> it would be insane, right? If you weren't required, if you were required to give the $3,000 in the near case, but you're not required to give $3,000 in the far case. And sort of similarly, if there was a, if there was ever a conflict, right? Where like there were two people on the other side of the brick wall. One just 10 feet away and the other a thousand miles away and your $3,000 could go to one or the other. I don't think you'd be required to give it to the near person rather than the far person. But your real life case involved more differences than just physical distance. So there's the fact that the homeless person just a few streets away might be somebody that you're acquainted with, that you physically bump into, like you see face to face. And you might not have that kind of personal encounter with anyone on the other side of the planet. There might also be considerations about that person being a member of your country and the other person not being a member of your country. I myself think that's another factor that is not really relevant in the life-saving context. So just having membership to the same country or having sharing the same passport. Even if that does give you some special reasons to favor a compatriot over a non-compatriot, it seems to me in these life-saving cases, it doesn't give you enough reason to make it a requirement to save the compatriot over the non-compatriot or require you to incur much greater cost to save the compatriot rather than the non-compatriot. But on the like kind of thing I mentioned in the middle, right, where you'd encounter the person, they're an acquaintance, you might bump into them. I suppose there, I don't know, I'm a little bit more open-minded about that making a moral difference, possibly in itself, but possibly just because of the impact it would have on you. If you're walking past someone every day and you see them, that could have a psychological toll on you. There's considerations like that to do with your own well-being that might actually make it plausible that you could at least be permitted if there was a conflict in how you use your resource, it might resources, it might be at least permissible to help this nearby homeless person rather than a distant homeless person because of those cost considerations. But as I say, maybe this thing about personal encounter has independent moral weight. I'm not sure. In the book, my line is that it doesn't have very much moral weight, but outside that project, I'm really not sure how much moral weight it has. I don't think I would have to change too much about the, the overall argument of the book. If I did claim that having a personal encounter gave you special moral reasons. So we can turn to a real life case. So during the pandemic, one of the questions was how should we best distribute life-saving vaccines? And we can imagine a number of different distribution right. methods. The one would be to say, whichever countries devise it or manufacture it, they can provide it to whoever will pay the most to them or to the citizens of that country. You might think that it should go into some global pool and that all countries ought to get some percentage of these vaccines in proportion to their populations. You might think that countries that are less likely to be able to distribute it effectively shouldn't get any at all because they'll waste them. So in South Africa, for example, some vaccines went to waste and uh, they weren't used. This has been the case in much of Africa that there's been high levels of vaccine hesitancy or that there's been corruption. So you could take the view, we're not giving you any vaccines because we don't think you'll use them or you won't use them effectively enough. Or do you say, well, some are going to go to waste, but we think that we're cosmopolitans here and we should try and save an equal number of human beings across the planet. Even if some are going to go to waste, some Europeans are going to die instead of some Asians, but that's how it must go. So if you're an effective altruist, not as an individual who's giving to a charity, but you're an effective altruist as either a state or a vaccine manufacturer or a one world government. 
How does that go? That's a great question. I mean, the truth is I'm really not sure. And again, this is a question where there's a lot of empirical stuff that would factor in. And if I were better informed, it would change how my answer goes. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a kind of like philosophy answer that might not get all the way to the real world case. But I suppose one question would be whether or not it's the benefits to the people getting the vaccines that is all that matters here or whether other considerations like giving them the chance to use something could matter independently. And so you might think that really you should be giving people chances to use a resource and everybody has an equal claim to the resource, even if ex ante, that some significant portion of the people that you give it to aren't going to use it in a way that would benefit themselves. So I think that's one debate to be had. And if you take the view like it's benefits only, and you combine that with an effectiveness optimizing requirement, then that could have some of the implications that you're suggesting. You would not give it to countries where there's no ex ante that they were going to use the resources effectively. But if that's not your view and you're just wanting to like optimize the chances of using the resource and you think it matters that people have a choice, that's sort of part of it, then that might not have the implication, but still whenever there's an op optimizing requirement. I think that's going to run into issues about fairness, right? So like, it might be that you could give one life-saving resource to one patient and it's known in advance would benefit them to a greater extent than if you gave it to another patient. And there's this huge like debate in bioethics about whether, um, instead of just giving it to the patient that would result in the most quality adjusted life years or whatever. You should give them a fair chance. You, you should toss a coin. And actually, I think something like that is plausible within certain like ranges of differences in welfare. So if somebody that was going to get the resource wasn't really going to get very much out of it at all, it was going to be almost a waste, then I think you're not required to toss a coin. But if it's like kind of close, then I could see the argument based on fairness for tossing a coin. Although even if you were required in that sort of case to give each patient a 50, 50 shot, when the difference in well-being is like sufficiently close, maybe you could extrapolate that to the macro scale of distributing large numbers of large amounts of resources. And you could argue that even if one of them is not optimal, there might be a reason of fairness to give them an equal chance or to hold some kind of randomizing a lottery. I'm wondering whether you don't have an epistemic problem or a knowledge problem. So the prototypical cases you give, we kind of know what's going on. So you're going for a walk and there's person A who's going to be run over by a boulder. There's persons B and C who are going to be run over by a different boulder. You know that you see exactly what's going on. You see both, both scenarios. You can jump in and help B and C, or you can jump in and just help that. If you help the one set, you're not going to help the other set. And that if you do help B and C, it will be double, doubly as effective as helping just A. So there's no knowledge problem there, but in a lot of cases, we don't have full knowledge of what's going on. So when we contribute to a charity, we don't really know how effective they are. We don't just know that ahead of time and especially we might not know about all the charities that exist. So when you're evaluating whether my actions in giving to a particular charity are right or wrong or optimal or not optimal, is what matters for the equation of whether my action is right or wrong, is what matters whether I, what I know and given what I know, it's the actions that I perform or is it what I should know. So how, the optimal agent, how much time does he take to work out what all the options are and what the effectiveness of each option is, or is it what just happens to happen? So in other words, regardless of what I know at the time, like the con consequentialist would say, what matters is what happens, but the consequence is regardless of what I thought would happen. Yeah. Great question. So I think it's not the last one. I don't think that's what determines what it's permissible to do at least in the sense that I'm using permissible throughout the book. I have something like subjective permissibility in mind and probably evidence relative permissibility rather than just belief relative permissibility. So it needs to be like, maybe not absolutely ideal agent, what they would know if they have the same evidence, but like what you could reasonably expect someone to believe based on the evidence that they have. 
So I think making permissibility relative to that kind of evidence is the standard that I have in mind. So it could turn out, right, that you reasonably expect that if you give to charity A, that'll save one life. And if you give to charity B, that'll save two lives. But in reality, it turns out that if you give to charity A, that will kill someone. And so actually objectively you should have given to the, the charity that it looked like was only going to save one life. Yeah. I hope I told that right. But anyway, the, the thought is just that, yeah, there, there can be cases where what's subjectively permissible for you to do comes apart from what is objectively permissible for you to do. And I'm thinking about throughout the book, what's subjectively permissible for you to do. Some people don't like that notion. They think that, look, there's just permissibility and it's objective permissibility. That's all that matters. That's the only sense of permissibility there is. And I suppose like, I don't want to have a fight with those people. I could just say, well, okay. What I'm talking about then is what a morally conscientious agent would do or something like that. So I'm not sure if this is the only epistemic problem you were getting at in your question, but there's also. Yeah, just the fact that in these cleaned up rescue cases, right, even if we're just focusing on subjective permissibility, it looks like you're very certain that if you put your legs in front of the boulder, this will save A, or if you put it in front of the other boulder, this will save B and C. And that's not so in the charity cases. You're absolutely right. So I think one kind of initial point about this is that although that is a difference between these cleaned up cases and the real world cases. There are things we can do to the cleaned up cases to make them more like the real world cases. So we could introduce some uncertainty about what would happen if you put your legs in front of, in the path of the boulder headed to A, rather than in the path of the boulder headed to B and C. And I guess I think that even if you're just giving like a pretty good chance of saving a life, suppose it's like only a 50% chance that you'd save B and C rather than a 50% chance of saving A, I think much of what I say would still carry over. I realize that's not the only epistemic issue here, but just as an initial response, the thought is just that just because there's uncertainty in one case rather than the other, isn't a fatal disanalogy between the cases. So throughout the discussion, we've assumed that the best way to be effective and help people is through charitable efforts. And we had on a guest called Andrew Cooper, who takes a different view. He thinks that charity is a good thing but there might be much better ways of being effective. And so he wrote a book on the topic, his supervisor at Cambridge was a March Sen, and then he left philosophy and he thought, let me actually go and try and enact some of these ideas. And so he started a company called Leapfrog, which is the biggest micro insurer in the world. So I think they administer about $2, $2 billion and starts an industry that basically provides financial products to the poorest of the poor were completely excluded from the market. And that industry, I think now is a multi-trillion dollar industry. Leapfrog itself affects 324 million people who beforehand had no access to various products that have helped uplift them out of poverty. And the idea is that charity isn't very sustainable, that people will give for a limited period of time. You yourself acknowledge that it's not always obligatory to, to donate, but if you're providing people with returns on their investment, well, they have every reason to keep giving you more money because they're making money out of it. And it so happens to be the case that a bunch of poor people are benefiting. So some of the products that are useful for people in the micro insurance setting, Humber Yunus pioneered this idea of lending small amounts of money to, to women to start garment businesses. Those few dollars you know, ultimately generated sufficient earnings for them to kind of feed their families and help them grow businesses much more sustainable. The insurance setting, you have people being provided with life insurance for only those that have HIV with a provi provisor that they take antiretroviral medication. So you have a benefit for both parties. So someone who'd given up on life because they thought they had a death sentence, wants an insurance product, no insurer wanted to insure someone because they seemed like they were going to die. And so someone fulfills the gap in the market. The person doesn't die because they take the medication. The insurer only pays them much later down the line. And this person now becomes a functioning, healthy member of society. There's all sorts of products along these lines. If one cares about being effective, shouldn't one rather be investing in these kinds of things as opposed to giving to charity? And maybe you might have an obligation to give charity, but you ought not to be investing in companies which let's say aren't performing these social goods. You should be maximizing profit with purpose. 
Yeah, I'm very open to that as a possibility. So there's still a question as an individual, what kind of difference can I make, right? And if we're talking about what sort of policy would be best here, then that's a different question. But as an individual, it might be that I recognize that one system, the one that you mentioned involving micro lending is a better, more sustainable system in the long run than one where people are continually dependent on the almost like whims, or I don't know, they're dependent on the decisions at least of other people, third parties, or perhaps foreign third parties. Right. So that's leaves them quite vulnerable. And you might think that's the suboptimal system. So there's a question though, about what my individual difference can make given the way things are currently set up. And I have to do a calculation where I could make a big difference to one person within a suboptimal system, or maybe make a less clear difference within a system that if it worked would be best over the long run. I mean, within the effective altruist community, I think it's been the case that at least when focusing on extreme poverty, the effective altruist community has looked at things like interventions that are backed by evidence that have randomized control trial backing. That's not so much the way EA is operating now. So I think over the past, I don't know, uh, six, seven years, they've moved away from this and are considering all different kinds of evidence and cases where there's like a complete lack of evidence as well. So we have to just go on almost like our hunches or the hunches of people that are experts in the relevant areas. And that's especially been the case in the context of trying to reduce existential risks. But I think that methodology is also being applied to extreme poverty to look at like these long-term questions as well. So I think it's an empirical question, whether giving to kickstart a micro lending program, the expected utility of that would be greater than the expected utility of giving to just a charity like the Against Malaria Foundation. But if it turned out that the expected utility was higher, then I don't see any like reason that an effective altruist should oppose that. I think they would be very much behind that. There could be conflicts with effective altruism in cases though, where the expected utility is for each individual choice, favoring the more short-term benefits, like giving to AMF. But nonetheless, if we all worked together to give to the micro lending program, this would be best. And yeah, there are these puzzles about conflicts between individuals and collectives in their altruistic efforts. And this is also something that's been on the radar of effective altruists recently, trying to overcome these each we dilemma kind of situations. But yeah, I think in principle, the easier answer, the one that doesn't involve so many puzzles is just that, well, yes, the expected utility could be high enough in some of these micro lending cases that even like in, on individualist grounds, it could be better or on a par with giving to against malaria foundation. Another interesting application of that problem is paying your taxes. So you could pay into a system, which in many countries is deeply ineffective, certainly in South Africa, it is, we have a highly inept government and your taxes are generally going to the lining of politicians pockets in South Africa. And you certainly could do more good by giving the same amount of money to either charitable organizations or to individuals. Arguably you are actually making the world a worse place by paying your taxes in South Africa. There are other countries perhaps where taxes go to better use, but even there, you might argue that even if the government is doing a good job and the state is distributing your taxes in a fairly effective way that, that there are still private institutions, which would do it better in those cases. Let's just say that it was the case that you're living in such a country. Are you morally obligated to avoid paying tax and rather hide the money away and give it yourself to a cause that you think should receive it? Yeah. I mean, I think in principle, the answer is yes. In principle, I could imagine a government like evil enough that I should avoid contributing to that government in cases where it's like, they're not pure evil, but they're just really ineffective. They're doing good. They're just doing like a little bit of good. Then it's much less clear to me that you should just, especially when the difference in the good that would be done 
through your taxes and the good that would be done through private means is not enormous, then it's much less clear to me that it would be justifiable not to pay your taxes. I mean, I think there are obvious legal reasons for that, but there are also moral reasons. It might be that you've, you're dependent on certain services and you would be free riding, but you wouldn't be playing fairly with your fellow citizens if you didn't pay your taxes. So there'll be like moral reasons not to cheat on your taxes that could be sufficient in, I would think most cases actually not to cheat on your taxes. Remember, I'm a non-consequentialist. So if you're a consequentialist, this might be a harder one to avoid, but I think there are reasons not to cheat, lie and steal and things. So I think, yeah, if the government's just inept, they're not producing a whole lot of good, then I think my view would be don't cheat on your taxes, but they could be sufficiently evil that yes, you should just break their laws to avoid contributing to this further evil. I have no comment on which category South Africa falls into. <laughs> yeah. We're a perfect mix of malice and incompetence. <laughs> so you hinted earlier at qualies and it might be that when we're comparing life for life in charities, it's easy to just have this fied thing. We say, well, which charity saves the most lives for a particular amount of dollars? Well, that's the one you pick, but the world's more complicated and there might be different kinds of lives. So people of a different age, people with different diseases, people in different parts of the world. What metric do you think we ought to use if what we're trying to do is let's say reduce suffering? How much of that is about reduction of death? How much of it is reduction of disease? What kinds of rescue projects should we be engaged in? And what are the optimal kinds? Are, can these things coexist along different silos or are we obliged to pick the best one and then put all of our money there? So I'm not sure what the metric is, and I'm not even sure that there is a single metric. I think you're absolutely right that it's easier when the harms and goods being compared are basically the same. We're just simplifying and looking at the number of lives for the amount of money, but you're quite right, right? Lives differ in terms of quality and length for starters. And even that is enough to really complicate the picture because we could imagine a case where the same amount of money could either extend one person's life by 80 years, or it could give 80 people each an additional year. Then you can also imagine cases that don't involve saving lives, where for the same amount of money of saving a life, you could prevent some number of headaches or toothaches. And a sort of like classical utilitarian view has it that you should just total everything up. And that in principle, if we're just minimizing suffering, we could in principle be minimizing suffering by preventing all the, the toothaches or hangnails or mild headaches or whatever it is. Maybe it's a million, maybe it's a billion, but there's some number of these like minor pains that it would be better to prevent than prevent one person's death or even pre prevent one person's torture for a few years followed by death. In principle, there's, you could just take any horrible ordeal for one person. And then there's some ungodly number of really minor things that, that would be even worse. So some effective altruists have that view. They have that fully aggregative picture in mind. I don't think that to be an effective altruist that you have to commit to that pretty counterintuitive view. You could have what some people call a partially aggregative view. So on a partially aggregative view, you should aggregate basically the way the utilitarian does or full aggregationist does, but only when the harms and benefits are like sufficiently similar. So you shouldn't be aggregating when they're sufficiently different. So like a life versus a hangnail pain, they would say that they can't aggregate in a way that could make it more important to prevent all those hangnails than save one person's life. So I think that's probably enough. That's probably all you need to get something like effective altruism going, something like a partially aggregative view. And I guess my take is like, look, if you're trying to help the most in either a fully aggregative sense or a partially aggregative sense, that's enough to like qualify you as participating in the project of effective altruism. And I think it's like, yeah, again, like a disagreement within effective altruism about which of these views about aggregation is correct. And like, it could turn out as well that 
there are incomparabilities. So there could be, cause you mentioned all of these different dimensions of value. And you, we see this, like, especially if you look across cause areas. So like, if you compare global poverty as a cause area with animal suffering, with the long-term future, those are dealing with three very different kinds of value potentially. And it might be that the best we can do is come up with a ranking that has like the best animal charity, the best long-termist charity and the best global poverty charity, but we can't claim that one of those charities is more cost-effective or does more good than the other. And in a situation like that, I think what the effective altruist should say is, well, it's not that you should be like doing the most good, but you should be doing no less good than you could have done otherwise, something like that. So like, since these are all on a par or incommensurable with each other, it's not the case that one does less good or helps less than the other. So that would be like the replacement to maximizing that they could offer in the event of like incomparability or in some kind of incommensurability or parity across different cause areas. So it seems right to me to say that there's certain things that are incommensurate and I wonder how far we can stretch that notion. So one is you say is this broad abstract category to say, okay, well, look, those things that are about animal suffering are just different from saving the environment or the destruction of the earth. And so we can just rank things in those categories. But you can imagine in the animal rights world saying, well, it's quite hard to pick between the suffering that stray dogs have versus majestic animals like elephants. Jeff Sebo took this view that we could kind of boil things down and add up the utils. And he thinks then maybe we have these massive obligations to insects that farmers should just let locusts wipe out their land instead of killing them. You've got this literal Holocaust against the locusts. So you're going to have a whole bunch of competing different views inside of each of these silos. And I wonder if the more we do that, the more that each person gets to say, well, look, I'm different. You must evaluate me on my own terms. Malaria can't be compared to ALS. They would just undermine the effectiveness of the project. That what we just have is a hundred thousand different projects, each of which says, well, I'm the best one in my silo of one. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely right. I mean, I think that's just, I think what you said is spawn on. So I think it's implausible that the incomparability goes that far. So I don't think it's plausible that if you have two animals that are of different species, that's enough to say that there's no comparability between them. Like if you could save one cat or a billion dogs, you should save the billion dogs. But if it's like one cat versus one dog, maybe that's in, incomparable or one cat versus two cats, maybe that's incomparable. But certainly a billion dogs versus one cat, save the billion dogs. So I think yeah, there, there'll be, there'll certainly be limits on how far this incomparability can stretch just in terms of like plausibility points, right? But then there's a, another question which might differ from the like plausibility points question, which is how far can it stretch for the purposes of remaining faithful to effective altruism? And there, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Like I think effective altruists would probably on the whole be okay with what I said about different cause areas. Um, but I'm not sure what, what toleration of incommensurability would be within the EA community. I'm not sure about that. You mentioned that you're not using utilitarian framework. What are the different moral tools that you use uh, to argue in favor of effective altruism? It's mainly analogies to these rescue cases. So I think that our intuitions about rescue cases are important data that not only support a family of different principles but potentially can be used for analogies to other cases. If we can argue that there are sufficiently big relevant differences between the cases being analogized to. So I take an a theoretical approach in the book. It's not that I don't have any theories that I like or anything like that, but I just want the claims to be portable. I want them to be the kinds of claims you could pick up and drop into contractualism or Rossian pluralism or virtue ethics or what have you. I want them to be claims that pretty much all traditions, major traditions in moral philosophy could in principle, at least partially get behind. That's my strategic reason for being a theoretical. And I think it also just makes it easier to write. If you just focus on cases, you don't have to get bogged down as much with theory. But I describe myself as a non-consequentialist. So I think that there are 
non-consequentialist prerogatives not to do what's impartially best. I also think they're non-consequentialist constraints that make it in some cases wrong to do what's impartially best. And I think like that's enough to like differentiate me from consequentialism. But then there are other things that I say throughout the book that I think would put me at odds with like, kind of consequentialist claims. So I'm sympathetic to some of the things that Frances Cam says about in the context of irrelevant utilities. So she has these cases where like you could save one person's life, you could save A's life, or you could save B's life, and you could save C's finger. And so consequentialists typically will say you'd be required to save B's life along with C's fingers, like can serve as a, at least as a tie break. I think it's still permissible to save A's life or to save B's life and C's finger. So that's just an illustration of another way, in which I don't think we need to be consequentialists to accept the main arguments in the book. I could say more about that if you like, but it, yeah, again, that's just for illustrative purposes. Well, Theron, I want to say thank you for a delightful conversation. We've already covered a lot of ground and it's been truly marvelous. Well, thank you so much. That was a, really a lot of fun and what fantastic questions. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I should mention the name of the book, by the way, is The Rules of Rescue, Cost, Distance, and Effective Altruism, and it's forthcoming with Oxford University Press in November of this year, 2022.